Okay, so a bit of a disclaimer right here off the bat. I have never actually read the whole Anne of Green Gables anthology of eight or so books uh, by Canadian author Lucy Montgomery, uh, written or, or at least published, I guess, in the early 1900s. I did go and, and track down uh, to borrow from a friend an old copy of the first book in the series so I could compare that to what I know uh, about what I have had the chance to look at, and, and, and that is the movie. And I'm talking specifically about the 1985 version of, of Anne of Green Gables, which came out when I was a kid. Um, like most guys growing up with a mom and a sister who were both partial to the story, um, or now being married, having a wife and a daughter who, who also enjoy this sort of thing, I have, I've seen the movie uh, several times at that. And uh, I'll go ahead and confess to you, though I've I've tried to be a good son, brother, husband, father, and share with the girls in the adventures of Anne Shirley. Um, and, and by the way, that's Anne with an E, right? <laughs> um, to my shame, and, and I just have to apologize to my wife for it, I'm not that romantic of a guy. <laughs> I do not uh, get very sentimental when it comes to the whole coming-of-age storyline, especially not one written for young women about uh, a, a somewhat awkward, freckled-faced red-headed orphan girl who always has her head in the clouds. She's always dreaming about poetry and flowers, bosom friends and kindred spirits, right? Um, until, of course, she begins to mature uh, through the catalysts of, of uh, a loving family, good education, discipline, uh, falling in love, and, and so forth. It's a classic girl's story. But I'll tell you, whenever I watch the movie, and, and now having, uh, having read the book, there is something that grabs my attention, and, and that really sparks my thinking. And it, it, it shows up early in the story. Um, as, as little orphan Anne arrives at the train station to be picked up by one Matthew Cuthbert, who is this uh, older gentleman, somewhere in his 60s, I guess, who, with the support of his sister Marilla, uh, neither of whom ever married in life. Um, and, and because Matthew is beginning to have some heart trouble and could use an extra set of hands to help him out on the farm, uh, they're expecting to adopt a boy who can, uh, who can begin to help them out on the farm. And, and then the surprise that comes when he finds out that the orphanage by mistake sends Anne, who obviously isn't a boy at all. And on the carriage ride home, as they're, they're traveling back to Matthew and Marilla's farm, known as Green Gables, and as they're, they're passing through the, the picturesque countryside of, of Prince Edward Island with its cherry trees and its, its apple trees in blossom, what, what jumps out to me isn't how splendid of a commute that is and, and how delightful it would be to live in such a place, though obviously I think that that is the thought that naturally comes to mind. But what jumps out to me about it all is, is how remarkable of a character the man who's driving Anne back to the farm must have. Um, I don't know how he's portrayed in other movie versions, but the casting in this 1985 version is, is so compelling to me. And it's not just compelling, it is actually quite convicting to me, because if I were to put myself in this guy's shoes, and if I had heart problems, and, and knew that my health depended on a strong and reliable young man to help me out, only to, to have this daydreamer on my hands who probably talks far more than she gets things done. Uh, not, not to mention the fact that because she's a girl, there's, there's probably not going to be much help digging post holes and plowing fields. My reaction to the whole monkey wrench in the plans would probably be um, a lot less charitable a lot less charitable. And, and yet to see Matthew Cuthbert's reaction and the kindness and the grace and the humility that he displays, um, well, I see more Christ-likeness in him than I often see in myself. Um, and, and by the way, I know we're just talking about a fictional character here, um, but, but Jesus spoke in parables too, right? Often pointing to imagined characters to model righteous examples. I'll admit, though, I'm not too familiar with where the, the author herself is coming from in terms of her, her own personal beliefs and, and what her own Christian convictions are that are written into the story. 
Um, I, I will say there are plenty of obvious Christian references made throughout the book, and, and uh, what I think is a, a, a very clear Christian faith shared by most of the characters in all of this. For example, I, I noticed how the main character of Anne herself is specifically described as a Christian, uh, though, though it's apparent very early on that what she's missing is, is a little bit of discipleship. Uh, in one of the early chapters, she admits that she's never been much of a, uh, in the habit of praying, uh, which she says is on account of her being somewhat resentful uh, to God because he made her with red hair, to which Marilla uh, Marilla reacts to that, saying, Why, Anne, what do you mean? Were you never taught to say your prayers? Don't you know who God is, Anne? And I love Anne's response to her. Anne says, Yes, God is spirit, infinite, eternal, and unchangeable. In his being, wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth. <laughs> That, of course, is a word-for-word -word quote of the Westminster Catechism. So, so apparently she's received some Bible training, though she still needs some help developing her prayers. In another chapter, she, she voices her appreciation for good preaching and solid sermons that, uh, that quote, let's see how she puts it, um, that are a, an influence for good, if their theology is sound and a stir of their hearers' hearts. Um, and, and on that note, in, in one of her typical daydreams, she imagines how, if, if she were a man, how much she would like to be a preacher and craft sermons that are uh, so much more interesting than most of the sermons she hears preachers preach. At another point, she talks about her understanding of what it means to be regenerate and, and how uh, when she meets the new minister's wife, she's encouraged that instead of being so melancholy, here's a Christian who, who's actually full of joy and kindness and, and sincerity. Uh, so I see a lot of Christian undertones in, in the characters in the story. And I especially see it in the Matthew Cuthbert character, even though it's not explicitly said, I see a, a kind of Christ-likeness that is built into his temperament that speaks for itself. Um, he's, he's described as being somewhat of a shy and, and meek man, content to live peacefully and quietly at his home of Green Gables. He's, he's a man who listens more than he talks, uh, who is gentle, uh, so gentle in fact that, that he is saddened every time he has to put down a lamb or a calf. Uh, when he is upset, or as the book put, puts it, when he's perturbed of mind, rather than expressing his anxieties with anger and frustration, which I know I often do, uh, his way of venting involves uh, sitting quietly in a chair, smoking his pipe, and calmly thinking it through. Um, he shows kindness in his gift giving of candy and, uh, what is it, uh, puff sleeve dresses for Anne. He's, he's quick to forgive. He's an advocate for Anne when others are against her. In fact, it's Matthew who decides first, despite the orphanage's mistake, to adopt Anne. And I find that to be such a, a, a gospel-like display because if you think about it, here is an unwanted girl who has much to be desired in what she can offer on the farm, at least to the, benefit, to the benefit of Matthew. And it is Matthew who has the most to lose in choosing to keep her, um, ultimately to his own demise, because by the, by, by the time you get to the end of the book, Matthew's heart problems don't improve. He does end up dying from, among other things, working himself too hard. But his sacrifice is worth it. Why? Because in choosing this little girl, he ends up being blessed himself, not, not only in the satisfaction that comes in showing grace to someone who can never pay you back, uh, but in the joy that's experienced in watching that person thrive because of the new life that your sacrifice has made possible. Right before he dies, Anne scores high marks on one of her academic tests, to which Matthew is just beaming with pride about while at the same time he's drooping physically because of his declining health. 
in that moment, Anne notices him not looking so good as Matthew goes about his farm chores and, and, and their interaction goes like this. You've been working too hard today, Matthew. Well, why won't you take things easier? Well, now I can't seem to, said Matthew, as he opened the yard gate and let the cows through. It's, it's only that I'm getting older and, and I keep forgetting it. Well, well, I've always worked pretty hard and I'd rather drop in harness. If I had been the boy you sent for, said Anne wistfully, I'd be able to help you so much now and spare you in a hundred ways. I could find it in my heart to wish I had been just for that. Well, now, I'd rather have you than a dozen boys, Anne, said Matthew, patting her hand. Just mind that. Rather than a dozen boys. Well, now, I guess it wasn't a boy that took the Avery scholarship, was it? It was a girl. My girl. My girl that I am proud of. And it's not long after that that he dies. I'd, I'd rather have you than a dozen boys. Never mind the fact that just one boy on the farm could have added more years to my life. Um, but, but here's a man who did nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility counted Anne more significant than himself. Does that remind you of anyone? Uh, F Philippians 2 says, uh, speaking of Christ and, and speaking of the influence that Christ should have in those who know him, uh, the scripture says, let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God as a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of man, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. That gives me a great deal of encouragement because um, more than anything, I want to be that kind of person. I want to be like Matthew Cuthbert. I, I want to have a mind and a heart that he had, which I believe is first modeled for us in Christ, which is a display of the gospel. Well, those are, are my thoughts on this respectable character from Anne of Green Gables. I'm, I'm sure there are those of you out there who know the story a lot better than me. And if you've, you've got your own thoughts about it, I encourage you to just uh, put them below. I invite you to, if you haven't already, like, subscribe to our channel. Looking forward to, to the next video we put out here. Uh, until then, thanks for watching and God bless. Mm -hmm.